honey. Thank you, Danny. Well, some of you may have noticed all the plaid behind the, the slides as we worshiped, and, and a few folks wearing some, or not plaid, but flannel. And uh, yeah, this is what, kind of my first flannel Sunday, so I, I'm kind of enjoying it. Never worn jeans at church before in my life, but this is kind of cool. Kind of cool. Enjoying it. Um, so, so, so today's unofficially flannel uh, Sunday. I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I really, really do. And I'm so glad that you, you, you chose to, to worship with God's people here today as we begin uh, what Christians for years or for centuries have called the Advent season, uh, a.k.a. Christmas. Just in case you're not familiar with the word Advent, let me kind of help you see how that fits into the context of, of the Christian life. Um, the Christian life is actually bookended by two Advents, okay? The ad Advent means the appearing. The appearing of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. So the Christianity began with that first advent. We call that Christmas, the birth of Jesus. The Lord appeared, and all of the events surrounding his life that we read about in the Gospels that initiated this thing called the Christian life, that was the first advent. And guess when it ends? The second advent. When the sky splits and the trumpet sounds, and the Lord returns not as a baby but as a conquering king. To judge the living and the dead and so here we are between the two advents and every christmas we take time to look back to the first one that started it all when god so loved the world that he gave his only son to be our savior so i am looking forward to this and as you can see we're going to be looking at five questions as we go through these sundays of christmas and considering uh, i think some some really really life-changing questions if we'll consider them so let's grab our message notes okay if you're a mess or if you're a note taker that there's message notes in the bulletin all of the scriptures are in there you can follow along there's some blanks it's always good to write some things down um, and then also i always put discussion questions so you can get together with some friends this week and and talk about it or just with your spouse or your family or whoever and revisit this five questions of christmas um the destiny of our life we're going to talk about destiny today a good bit the destiny the direction of our life what god wants to do and through us and in us is largely determined by the questions that each of us is willing to ask you ever said someone to someone you know are you willing to go there you know are we going to go there uh really even there uh, you're going to open up the closet of your heart, so to speak, and let people see, you know, be honest with God about all those areas of your life. Uh, the questions that we're willing to ask and honestly answer and deal with before God have a huge impact on our destiny and the direction of our life. So in this series, as I just said, we're going to deal with these five questions. And next week, we're going to deal with the question that Joseph had to wrestle with, which is, Will I trust and obey God even when everything in life is falling apart? When nothing makes sense? When everything in my head says, this is scary, this is not good, this is wrong, go away. Well, but I know in my heart it's the right thing to do. Will I trust the Lord even in those times? Uh, the week after that, we're going to look at the, the, the question that the shepherds wrestled with, which is, who is this Jesus? The angels proclaimed in the heavens, you know, that in the city of David, a, a Savior has been born. And, and then, you know, there's this huge light show from heaven. And then they had to, to decide for themselves, who is this Jesus? They run and, and check things out. <clears throat> we'll, we'll deal with that in week number three. Week number four, we're going to ask the question that the wise men asked, which is, what gift will I bring to the king? What gift will I offer Jesus and then in week five on Christmas Sunday we'll uh, come alongside the innkeeper and we'll deal with his question which is will I make room for Jesus in my life it's gonna be awesome today though we're gonna deal with this powerful question that Mary dealt with which is will I embrace God's destiny for my life and we're gonna look at Luke chapter 1 verses 26 through 38 that's all written written in your your outline if you want to follow along i'm going to start in verse 26 uh, from luke's gospel 
In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at this or at his words, and, uh, or the words of the angel, and she wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor, or literally, grace with God. For you will be with child, and you will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Um, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, uh, which was, would also be Israel, forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And then these, these words have been pondered by Christians and theologians for centuries. This is the crux, if you will, or a foundational pillar of the Christian faith. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So powerful. Jesus, fully human, born of an earthly mother, fully divine, because his father was none other than God. Miraculous conception. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. Um, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. And then we come to the words that I really want to focus on the remainder of our time together. Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant, Mary replied. Uh, May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. I am the Lord's servant. That's the question I want us to kind of ask ourselves this, this morning. Am I the Lord's servant? Can I, can I say that with Mary today? I am drawn to this question because I really believe that that little phrase, I am the Lord's servant, I think that that reveals the, 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 the source uh, that, that enabled Mary to believe and to receive and, and to embrace God's call to step into this unbelievable role of being the mother of the Messiah. We have to understand that for literally thousands of years, Every little Jewish girl grew up wondering, will I be the one? Will it be me? Or is this the, you know, will I be among the generation, let alone will I be the mother of the Messiah? This is like, this is through the roof amazing uh, what Mary's uh, experiencing here, as you can well imagine. And her choice of words is so, I think, important and telling. I am the Lord's servant. Okay, we're going to break that down. First, I want us to consider that first word, I. Seems like a simple little word, single letter. But beside that letter I, I want you to write in the blank there in your outline, if you're taking notes, responsibility. Mary is taking personal responsibility for her life and her faith. When the angel approached Mary and said, you're going to be the earthly mother of the Messiah, Mary didn't look around and say, hmm, I wonder what everybody else will think about this. I wonder if this will be acceptable. I wonder if people will criticize me. I wonder, you know, what what other people will think. Mary said, without saying it, this isn't about anybody else. This is about me and my walk with the Lord. And what he's calling me to do in my generation and in my life. This is about my faith, my destiny, and God's plan 
for my life. Mary is owning this. She's taking personal responsibility. The art of growing up, really and truly maturing, is about growing in responsibility. It's about taking responsibility for oneself. We begin our life as infants without any personal responsibility. Everything that we need is done for us. Right? We just lay there. Somebody feeds us and cleans us up and changes us and carries us wherever we need to go and dresses us or whatever. But as we progress through the stages of childhood, we begin to take more and more responsibility. We learn how to tie our own shoes. We learn how to clean our own rooms, hopefully. <laughs> we turn in our own homework. We learn that responsibility has rewards. And the irresponsibility has other less desirable effects. In many ways, the difference between a child and an adult is our willingness to take personal responsibility for our own lives and our own actions. That's what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. He's writing a group of Christians there, and he's talking about growing up. Uh, but also, uh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. This particular verse, Paul's talk, uh, writing in 1 Corinthians, rather, chapter 13, verse 11. We're going to get to Galatians later. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Paul says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. There's no doubt Jesus calls us to have childlike faith. We, we are always called to approach our Father with that childlike, simple, trusting faith. But there's a difference between childlike faith and childish behavior. Right? We should always maintain that childlike faith, but as we grow up, we ought to take responsibility for our own lives in terms of our ethics and our morals and, and work and conducting ourselves and all of those things. And, and, and Mary is taking that kind of personal responsibility. When, when the angel said, highly favored are you, you're going to be the mother of the Son of God, Mary was able to embrace it because before this conversation happened, she'd already decided, I am the Lord's servant. That's huge. The second word is am. Just a little bit larger word, just two letters now, right? I am the Lord's servant. Beside that word, I want you to write in that blank in your notes, Resolve. Mary drew a line in the sand and she stepped over it. There was no looking back. Though no one go with me, still I will follow. I am all in. Mary didn't say, I'd like to be the Lord's servant. I wish I was the Lord's servant. Maybe someday when I get my life together and get a few of these things figured out, then I'll be the Lord's servant. There's no hint in here that Mary thinks she's arrived or that she thinks she's perfect. She simply says, I am the Lord's servant. It's a done deal. My life is His. My life is in His hands. I'm His servant. God promises renewed strength for those who hope in Him. God promises forgiveness to those who repent and turn to Him. God promises blessing to those who trust and obey Him. God promises reward for those who are faithful. But God doesn't promise anything to fence sitters. God doesn't promise anything to people who say, well, I, I kind of like to be a servant of God. I, yeah, I kind of believe in God. I, yeah, I think I believe in God. Um, Mary had stepped over that line. I am the Lord's servant. God, so encouraging to me. God is not looking for perfect people. Hallelujah. That's what the cross is all about. As we've talked about today, and as Ray just mentioned during in communion, it is the blood of Jesus that, that covers our sin and makes us right with God, and so grateful for that. God isn't looking for perfect people, but you know what He is looking for? Surrendered people. He's looking for people who've, who are done with the debate who are done with waffling, who are done with going back and forth in terms of who Jesus is. And they've surrendered their life to Him as Lord and Savior. They're thankful for God's grace every day in their life, but they get up every day and say, You are my Lord. 
and you're who I live for. And if I stumble, it won't be because I stumble in the world's eyes or anyone else's eyes. It'll be because I fall short of your standard, God, and you are the one that I will come back to and say thank you for your grace and I repent afresh and I put my eyes freshly back on you. I am the Lord's servant. Third word. I am actually two words here. I am the Lord's servant. Beside that word, I want you to put exclusivity or exclusive. Mary declared, I don't have any allegiance to this world. I don't belong to this world or to anything in this world. I don't have any allegiance to convenience or popularity or what anybody else thinks about me my allegiance my loyalty my devotion is to God and to God alone to the Lord exclusively that's a really powerful concept to understand about Christianity Jesus didn't say make me Lord and three other people give your heart to the kingdom and also to your whatever it's a very exclusive call to abandon all others and to, to follow Christ alone and when we make this decision to take ourself or the world or whatever used to be on the heart or on the throne of our heart off and put Jesus there, something really amazing happens. Life becomes simple. Now let me explain. Because I am not saying life becomes easy. Okay? <laughs> There's a big difference between simple and easy. Life is hard, period. Bad things happen to good people. But life becomes much simpler in terms of what I say yes to and what I say no to. Because now that Jesus is on the throne of my heart exclusively, my life is all about one question. Does it honor my king? No matter what I'm going through, where, whatever, no matter what decision I have to face, whether it's about entertainment for that day or my life or the words I speak or how I treat my spouse or my kids or my coworkers or conduct myself as I go through my day, whatever decision or a huge life decision, whatever it is, the question is, does this honor my king? And I know there's going to be times you have to choose between a couple things that are close and all that. But in terms of, is there a red flag? Is this going to bring dishonor to, to my Lord? Then I'm not going to do that. Is this something that, that I can glorify Him in? Then I can feel good about moving forward with this. Knowing that God was her king, knowing that she was exclusively the Lord's servant, made Mary's decision here simple. Man, it would not be easy. Mary was going to face incredible struggle and trials and hardships. I mean, it's going to begin next week when we look at Joseph and she has to have that talk with him. Well, uh, honey, you know, where, how does that go? How do you approach that, ladies? How do you, how do you go to your betrothed husband knowing that that in that day he could stone you for being pregnant out in, in this moment you know I, I mean right out of the gate she's facing some serious hardships and then she has to love and raise this little boy and then watch him be executed in front of her eyes when he's in the prime of his life I mean there's nothing simple or easy about this but it wasn't something she had to really debate on because she was the Lord's servant and then we come to the fourth part of this. Where Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. I love this. Um, what is your role? That's the word that we want to put there. Role. I am the Lord's servant. What is your role in life? What is your role in the world? Are you the boss? Are you large and in charge? Or are you the servant 
of the Lord. That's a huge distinction. I remember when I used to, when I was a much younger man, I used to race motocross. I used to race dirt bikes. And I loved it. I got the aches and pains, man, big time to prove it now when I get out of bed. A leave is my best friend going to bed, you know. It's like all those jumps and whoops. But I remember that some of these guys back in that day, they would have these stickers on their, on their bike that said, God is my co-pilot. And I used to think that was so cool. You know, wow, God is their co-pilot. You know, that's cool. I used to really think that was just the neatest thing. But the longer I walk through life, the more I came to the conclusion that that's really kind of a lousy message. God is my co-pilot? You know, I'm really thankful that God allows me to call him Father. He's my heavenly Father. I'm, I'm really grateful that, that He has adopted me into His family and that I'm a child of God through faith in Jesus. He's my Abba Daddy, that He has commissioned me to be an ambassador for Christ, a representative for Jesus in this world, that I can enter into God's presence because of Christ and receive mercy and grace in my time of need. But at the end of the day, we are not equals. God... I'm blessed that he calls us friends through faith in Jesus, but it's not like we're buds in that sense that I get to tell him how to run his deal. You know, I don't advise God. At the end of the day, he is Lord, and I am his servant. And Mary understood this so well. And so it was much simpler for her to say yes to what God was calling her to. The word servant here, it's a really cool word. I am the Lord's servant. The Greek word is doule, or doule, that good pronunciation. It literally means bond servant or bond slave. If you don't know what a bond slave is, there's a cool story behind it. Uh, in the first century, of course, there were slaves. And occasionally a master, many masters, were very kind and wonderful to their slaves. And, and occasionally a master would set a slave free and grant them their freedom. But the slave, in return, because they loved the master, would take their freedom and say, thank you for setting me free. Now I want to use my freedom, not for myself, but to serve you. Not because I have to, but because I want to. I am your bond slave. And they would sometimes be branded or marked in some way or pierced, uh, sometimes in their ear, to, to mark them as this bond slave. <clears throat> and that's what Mary's saying. Thank you that I'm free to make this choice but I choose to use that freedom to serve you. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14. Here's where Paul talks about this. He says, You brothers and sisters, you are called to be free. Jesus set us free from sin and death and separation from God and, and hell and fear of those things. But Paul says, Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, your sin nature. Don't take your freedom and go run amok. <laughs> but rather, serve one another in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wonderful. See, Mary was able to stand there in the presence of Gabriel and hear this unbelievable unimaginable announcement that she was going to be it was God's destiny for her it was his call on her life to, to, to be the earthly mother of the son of God and to walk through all that that would entail she had no idea what the next day would, would bring it wasn't an easy thing to do but it was a simple decision for her because she understood I'm a bond slave of the Lord I'm his I belong to him I love Him. My life is all about honoring Him. It's not about anybody else. And so then we come down and we need to personalize this question for ourselves. Will I embrace God's destiny for my life in terms of your marriage and the kind of husband you are, the kind of wife you are, and God's call on your life in that relationship, or, or if you're not married, just at work or at school or among your friends, as you live your life and use the talents and abilities and finances and life and breath that God has given you. Are you, are you able and willing and, and joyful about stepping into this role and say, Lord, I'm yours. I 
am the Lord's servant. Little checklist, okay? Let's just walk through these one at a time. Number one, responsibility. Have you taken personal responsibility for your faith? Because it's when we stand before Jesus, there won't be anyone else accountable for our lives but us and the decisions we've made and our growth. Are you growing in the Lord? Because that's not about anyone sitting beside you. That's about you, right? And your decision daily to seek Him and follow Him. Number two, resolve. Is the debate over? Is the waffling over? It's not talking about being perfect. It's about the world behind me, the cross before me. Number three, exclusivity. There's no one else on the throne of my heart. I may stumble, but I get back up and I fix my eyes back on one person, Jesus Christ. Number four, roll. I wake up every day and I understand I'm a grateful, forgiven child of God. He's my king and I want to live for him in whatever situation I find myself in. Friends, if you can say yes to those, then you're ready to step into God's destiny for your life, whatever it may be as you move forward. It's not about being perfect, praise God. It's about being surrendered. If you've never surrendered to Jesus, man, first day of Advent, what a great time to come and say, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'd invite you to come and do that as we sing this next song. And um, let's walk through Christmas remembering what a great example Mary is for us all. Let's pray. Father, I love you, and I, I really thank you for the life of Mary, for the example she sits or sets for us of just simply understanding that whatever you bring into our lives, we say amen to because we are your servants. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that he accomplished in his life and on the cross for us. Thank you for his shed blood that makes it possible for us to come to you and put faith in you and trust you and, 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 and receive a new life. God, may we come today if we need to do that. May we, if we need to say, hey, you know what, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I need to be encouraged. I need to let this example of Mary encourage me to go forward as a servant in my week and my life this Christmas and every day. May we say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.